Good Thursday morning. I'm glad you all are joining us if you're joining us live. Uh, good Thursday morning to you if you're joining us live, as I just said, or if you're joining us later, um, welcome to uh, the Ladies Breakfast Bible Study. I'm so glad to be back and thankful for the to the Lord for <clears throat> keeping me this week. I got smashed again a little bit last week and woke up Thursday feeling really bad. Um, but um, I, I did not get have COVID. We had tri tried that. Um, but it left me pretty miserable for, for a while. So I'm still recovering, but I'm feeling much, much better, for which I'm very grateful. So thank you for those of you that said you were praying and, and sent your best to me. I, I appreciate it. It was very encouraging. I'm going to get right to it because I want to finish today on our case for God's forgiveness. And I wonder if you're asked if you have asked yourself, <clears throat> I wonder why Vicky's spending so much time on God's forgiveness. And I, I, you know, I asked the Lord that um, I think it's because we have to really understand our father's character and what he not only says about <clears throat> forgiveness, but also what, how he, how he did forgiveness, what the Bible says about it in, in relationship to him. And that's really important for us to learn. We can learn from that so easily. Um, and so I want to build a really strong foundation of God's forgiveness. So <clears throat> two weeks ago, we talked about how when you have a case in court, you build the case with facts. You, you lay it out. Here's what it is. And you answer all the questions uh, to see if you have enough evidence. And so that's what we're doing on this case for God's forgiveness. Um, the last, the, the closing arguments are today, the last two. I got to the first two, which was, what is God's forgiveness? The first question. And then we ended two weeks ago with, when is God's forgiveness? And we learned, <clears throat> let me switch back a little bit. We learned that it actually started as early as um, Eden, uh, where God covered their sin uh, with uh, his own um, his own doing. He's the one who slayed the animal and covered them. Um, so that's the first win. Uh, the win of God, for God's forgiveness is without hesitancy. When does he forgive? Immediately. When does he forgive? He forgives those that call on him. That's at that time, he forgives. Um, so when, as often as he's approached, that's when he forgives. When he says now, for he says in favorable times, I listen to you and in the day of salvation, I have helped you, but behold, now is the favorable time. Now is the day of salvation. And so we learned that that word behold means pay attention to, fix your eyes on. So that's another when. And then we ended two weeks ago with this one about the now. Um, what God is saying is don't put off my forgiveness. That seems counterproductive, doesn't it? That if, if someone is ready to forgive you, that you would put that off. I don't, I don't want that, but that's true. Um, and that's why it's in the Bible. <clears throat> it's in the Bible because people do put it off both the unbeliever and the believer. And for the unbeliever, you may be listening and, and, um, you, you know that you're not a believer. You are not a Christian. You have never received the Lord in a personal way in your life. You might be, have gone to church, but you know in the deepest part of you, I am not a follower of Jesus Christ. And if that's the case, he says this to you. Now is your time. So the other when to end this is um, when he draws us because we can't just decide on our own when we're 99 to come to God. It doesn't work that way. He says, no one comes to me unless the father who sent me draws him. So there's a condition on that. So the when is when he draws us, when the Lord draws us <clears throat> as an unbeliever, when you became a Christian, you know when that was. And um, I remember when I was. And But then God also draws us after we are saved, after we become his children. He doesn't do it to push us away. He convicts us of our sin, of our shortcomings, of our disobedience, of our bad attitudes, of our whatever. Uh, but he, as he does that, he draws us to himself. He says, come here, little chickadee. I want, I, want to, I want to talk to you. I want you to understand. I want to cover you. And we're going to get more into that. 
And here's what the Bible says to both the believer and the unbeliever. Today, if only you would hear his voice, do not harden your heart. So he's telling us, if you are an unbeliever and you know that my spirit is calling you, that's a blessing. R respond to it. Receive God's forgiveness. And if we are a believer and God is speaking to us and he's calling us and he's bringing us to himself, rejoice because it, it would be like a, a, a young person that doesn't have any mores. They don't have any boundaries in their life. They're just a left to do whatever they want. Um, that's a sad situation for them to have to make all of their own decisions. It's no boundaries, a drift, no guidance. I thank the Lord that we are children who are cherished and loved. And so his conviction draws us to godly repentance, um, or rather godly sorrow, which leads us then to repentance. Aren't you thankful for that? I'm so grateful for that. You might say, well, I don't want to decide on that right now. I know I'm in disobedience. I know that I've I've drifted away from the Lord, but I don't want to decide about obeying him. Well, long ago, I learned this uh, quote, which I think is pretty accurate. It said, not to decide is to decide. And that's very true. When we say, I don't want to, I don't want to really make up my mind about this. Whatever it is, it's to decide you have already made that decision. So we can respond now and not ever get into that danger zone. The Bible says in Hebrews, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? So if you're a believer or an unbeliever and you're hearing today, then today's the day. Today's the day to come to your father and to repent and to receive his wonderful forgiveness. That's the last win. Now we're gonna go into an interesting part of our closing arguments, and that's the why. Why does God forgive? Why is there God's forgiveness? Well, it is part partly because there's a broken relationship that started as we just referenced way back in the Garden of Eden. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> it's only on our part because God has never moved. Have you ever said, God, where are you? <laughs> and his answers, if he could answer us um, outright, he would say, um, I've never moved. I'm exactly where I've always been. What happens is we are the ones who move. And in the garden, we moved, we as humans, we moved away from him and out of his plan. And so that's the reason for his forgiveness is because the relationship was broken. And, and the truth is we can't do enough to get back into relationship. That's why the law didn't work. We can't follow enough guidelines. We can't be good enough. We can't teach enough or go to church enough or do all the things enough in order to make it okay with our relationship to God. There is a breach a brokenness. And so um, the, that's the reason for God's forgiveness is it's, as we said, it started in his heart before the foundations of the, of the earth. It started in God's heart that he was going to come and find a way. And he already knew what that way would be, that he would come himself to rescue us. Trying to run away from God, trying to please him in those ways is exhausting and it just can't be done. So why? The first one is to restore the relationship that's broken between God and us. The second reason is because he's the great I am. He doesn't, God works in the present. He's our present help. He's our present life. He said, I am that I am. Um, and I know that when um, when the disciples came and said, where, where have, or Mary, I think it was, was the first one who said, where have you laid him? And they said, he is not here. He is risen. They, the angels didn't say he has risen. They said he is risen. He's presently arisen from the, from the grave. And he is the great I am. And God preciously does not drag us back into our past mistakes and our past hurts, our past pains and our wounds of the past. No, he says, now is the accepted day to make it right, to come back to me, to, uh, to keep that breach from getting any deeper. Now, I'm not gonna drag you back to that. I'm here now. I am the great I am. And I stand ready to clear the channel. Why Why is God's forgiveness? It's to clear the channel between us, this, 
the vertical channel between us. It's sort of like <clears throat> when I thought about it, I, I thought about a clogged drain that's partially clogged. The water still goes through, but you have to stand and look at it and it takes forever because the debris that has been built up in that uh, drain stops the drain from working the way it was designed to work. And that's clearly, you turn on the water and it goes down. You can watch it and you can hear that sound. And so what we have to do in the natural is clean out the drain of the debris that over time has built up. And sometimes we don't even realize that we have a clogged drain until it runs slow. We go, oh, that's running slow. And then we stick, you know, we do all the things that we do. Well, God, God sees that and he draws us to himself for us to see. You know, there's something between us. <clears throat> We're still you're still my child, but you're not um, you're not working the way I have designed you to work because there is debris between us. And I want there to be a clear channel between you and me. That's his love for us. And that's one of the whys as we present our closing arguments in God's favor for his forgiveness is because he wants there to be unfettered relationship. Why? Is there God's forgiveness? Because it teaches us mercy. Um, now, mercy is intrinsic in God. He doesn't have to be taught that. That's part of who he is. It's part of his character. And because of that, it cannot be exhausted. God's mercy is always there. And so what, so, but what that does is that teaches us mercy as he allows us to partake of all that he is. He invites us to do that. And so we can partake of the mercy that's intrinsic in him. Um, and it's the driving force that leads him to follow us, to come after us. The Bible says in Psalm 139 that you can't get away. You can't get high enough or low enough. He's always there. But what drives him is that desire for there to be that clear channel between us. Because God is not cold and sterile. He's warm and compassionate, and he, and he is passionate about his relationship to his children. And so that's the other why, to teach us that mercy and that passion, to make sure that we have that, that uh, clear channel between us and our Father. And it teaches us perspective. Yeah. Oh, we just think, you know, we just pat ourselves on the back and... Um, but God teaches us the perspective, and here's what the word says. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness. And so this teaches us perspective that God does not keep a record of our sin. Uh, he hides it. He throws it away, stomps on it, throws it in the sea, um, crushes it as he takes it from us. And that's another uh, clear indication of the pattern that he, he, he um, leaves for us to follow. Why? Why God's forgiveness? Because he said he would and he keeps his promise. That's one thing about God. He keeps his promises because he cannot lie. He is the keeper to be faithful to his word. And here he's, here's what he says. I I am he who blots out your transgressions. Why? For my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. And that just really jumped out at me the second or third or fourth time that I read that. Why does God forgive? What is the case for God's forgiveness and the why? For his own sake. Did you get that? That is staggering when we really understand it. For his own sake, God keeps us clean because he wants us to be clean. He continues to wash away our sins through the sanctification for the rest of our days on earth. That's why believers, we have an advocate. That's why we say, forgive me, Lord, because God wants there to be relationship. And he does, he does that for his own sake, he says, because he can't tolerate sin. And so his desire is for us daily to be reconciled to him through forgiveness. Isn't that a most beautiful picture? The, what motivates God's forgiveness is for there to be reconciliation with his children. Because he knew that we couldn't, once we we're saved, just make it all the way through to eternity. Um, 
without ever needing his forgiveness. And so he says, this is for my sake, that I, my mercies are new every single day. And then as you grow in the Lord, and as you make mistakes, and as you fail me, I want to be there immediately to forgive you. And here's what, he, here's what Lamentations 3.22 says. <clears throat> Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. Yay. Because his compassions, plural, fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Aren't you just so thankful for God's gracious um, forgiveness for us every single day? Again, to keep us close to his heart. Have you ever been with someone and you know that there's something between you? You're not sure what it is, but there's just that awkwardness and something's not settled. Uh, it can be your husband, it can be a child, it can be a friend, someone at church, but you just know that. And it's a terrible feeling. And unless you can get to the bottom of it, it will remain and grow. God knows that. And he's saying, I have provided a way through my Holy Spirit because I love you. And for my own sake, to keep you close to my heart, because that's what you mean to me. So I love that. We don't want to be a clogged drain, do you? I don't want to be a clogged drain. And the last uh, argument, <laughs> our closing arguments, is not only the, we've already done the what, we've done the when, we just finished the where is God's forgiveness. I mean, the why of God's forgiveness. And now we're in the last step, and that is the, the uh, where. Where is God's forgiveness? Is it after I get counseling? Is God the last stop when I have a situation that I need to, to get, do I get rectified? Do I go to my mom? I used to call my mom for everything. She was a uh, prayer, just kind of came out of her pores. She prayed and she was just this godly, precious, anointed woman and, and, um, as I grew older, I loved her more and appreciated her more. But I always called my mom with everything. Many times before I ever asked God, smack me, but it was really true. So is that where God's forgiveness is after we seek help and he's waiting patiently to be there for us? Um, how about when I get to church, then I'll make it right with God when I get to church. When I was a growing Christian, <clears throat> I was in high school <clears throat> and um, there was a young lady that we became really good friends. And in the course of that, she was able to receive Jesus as her savior. And it was precious to see that the change in her life. And uh, as, as I grew in the Lord, I also grew stupid because of my age. And so I went through a time there where I I just cooled off, you know, God didn't move again. God had never gone anywhere and I loved him, but I just was tired of being called Deacon, which is one of my names in high school. I found out 20 years later. Um, and I, I guess I thought I could try to be cool. And so I, I didn't do anything weird. Like I didn't go out into, into deep sin, but I was not serving the Lord properly. And I knew that in my heart, just like I said, believers, we know when we're not right with God, I knew that I was not right. And months went by and this went on. And one day, this same girl that I was able to share Jesus with and had become a Christian, she came up to me in the hallway and she just, she was very short and she looked up to me and these are the only, this is the only thing that she said, four words, what's happened to you? And she walked away. Well, that was just like she had taken a, a sword and, and, and drove it through my heart. Those four words were like God himself talking to me. In fact, it was. He talked through her, this younger in the Lord Christian to me. What's happened to you? And because I was a young Christian and still growing, I thought I had to wait to church. And I... <laughs> I remember going to a panic as, as my heart was so broken that I had, that I had um, 
disappointed the Lord that I had not done what I knew was right. And then I'd done stupid and I'd been arrogant and, and I had been disobedient. But I remember praying, please don't come, Lord, please don't come. When I, and because it was several days that went by before Sunday. And I said, oh, please let me get to church. Please let me get to church. Because mistakenly, I thought that where God's forgiveness was, was in church at an altar. And I remember running at the end of service. I couldn't wait for him to get done because our altars were always open uh, in our church. Uh, and I ran to make it right. And I realized, of course, as I grew in the Lord, that God was boom, right there in that hallway at school. I could have just said in my heart, oh, God, forgive me. Even though in my heart, I was already sorrowful. But I thought I had to do the perfunctory thing of, dear Jesus, forgive me for my sin. And this is what I did. And I'm so sorry at church at an altar. So isn't that wonderful to know that God isn't like in a place uh, his forgiveness is not in a place. It's not after we get counseling from some someone else because he's our father and he lives within us. And so it's a personal thing. His forgiveness is everywhere because it's not physical. It's, it's, um, it's in my spirit. We can approach him anywhere. Where, where is his forgiveness? It's on the inside. And what happens is when God forgives on the inside, that it changes and reflects on the outside. So let me explain really quickly, and I'm going to get to this later as we teach about our forgiveness of each other, is that forgiveness is spiritual. In other words, if I, let's say that, <coughs> that I start a fire. Why I would do that, I don't know, but it just came to my mind. I started a fire, and in the starting of the fire, um, I got burned. And afterwards, I realized that, oh, that's a horrible thing. And I said, oh, God, forgive me for doing that. And I would be instantly forgiven as my heart was, was true to. If I came with in a true confession, God would forgive me instantly. But I might have a few scars or that those burns would still hurt. God would not say, you are forgiven spiritually and all the burns are gone. No, it doesn't work that way. There are consequences to our decisions, to whatever they make. And some of them are good, great consequences, and some of them are not so good. And so God's forgiveness is internal and it reflects then on the external if we allow him to. So where is God's forgiveness? As I went this, I'm going to read it because I wrote this sort of out of the stream of consciousness that the way my mind goes. Uh, where is God's forgiveness? God's forgiveness is found in a humble hut in a faraway land. It's found in gilded rooms of a palace, in the steel cages of prisons. It's found in the urban alleys of addiction and in the posh corporate offices of America. God's forgiveness is found in the sterile pulpits where truth was once heralded. And it's found in the cavernous halls of power, and authority. His forgiveness is found in the solitary heart, drowning in hopelessness and guilt, and also in an icy cold heart, blinded by arrogance. So God's forgiveness goes from the uttermost to the uttermost. It's found wherever a contrite heart is. And there, in, in all the places that the Lord showed me, in, in huts and in palaces and in uh, uh, places of authority and power, the halls in courts and in alleys of addiction and in the heart of man, God's forgiveness will come if we ask him because it's not confined to church. It's not confined to one place because God is everywhere. And so <clears throat> his forgiveness and the, 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 um, the case for his forgiveness is just that. Wherever I may be found, I am in the present. I am your present help. I am that I am. And so we could always know that there's a place for us to go. And the last part of what I want to share with you today is all of those places is where God's forgiveness is found. But it's also, it was also found in the frigid waters of the North Atlantic on April 15th, 1912, in the sinking of the Titanic. 
And this is a beautiful story that I was introduced to a number of years ago that I've never forgotten. It made a huge impact on me. And you, some of you probably already know this story, but if you don't, listen, because it's really precious and it really illustrates where and why and what and when God's forgiveness is unleashed. John Harper was a Christian minister from Scotland and he was on his voyage from Scotland to preach at Moody Bible Church in Chicago, established by the great D.L. Moody. With him on the Titanic was his daughter, six years old, and his sister. His wife had died. When the Titanic hit the, the iceberg and the and people were made aware, wow, you know, something's going on. He began to go up and down the decks, <coughs> calling out, repent, repent, know the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, receive him, call on him, believe him, and you will be saved. Um, and then as the uh, great Titanic took on that water, he put his six-year-old daughter and his sister in a lifeboat, and they they left and they were saved. But he ran back and forth, repeating as the water got higher and higher. And finally, he was in the water himself. Before he went there, he tossed his life jacket to someone who did not have one. And in the deadly water, he continued his cries. Are you saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And he called this out across the water. And you all know what water does. It, it amplifies. Jesus went out in the boat and taught. It amplifies. You can hear across a lake almost uh, someone talking. You might not be able to pick, but he was yelling as he knew things were very, very dire. One man that was in the water named Aquila Webb, he answered no when he heard that question. Are you saved? He said, I answered no. When John Harper was taken away on a wave, but just within a, a half of uh, a minute, John Harper came back on a second wave because it was all roiling in that frigid North Atlantic. And he asked him again, are you saved, sir? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. This time, Mr. Webb's heart was pricked. And as the minister disappeared into the dark waters, he confessed his sin and he believed and received the Lord. He was one of only six people who were rescued from the water. Two years later in Canada, he rose to give his testimony and called himself John Harper's last convert. And you could look up um, in Google, if you just look up under John Harper's last convert, you can read the whole story. It's an amazing story, but it touched my heart. Not only that John Harper was, was um, obedient and filled with love and selflessness to the last because he knew where he was going. In a short time, he was going to be in glory with the Lord, but he wanted to be sure that there were others that could receive. And we don't know that there were not others who heard that voice of forgiveness calling across that water before they died, gave their heart to the Lord. And so his precious forgiveness was there at the sinking of the Titanic and all the other places that we've mentioned and in our heart. So the case for a, a forgiving God to me is airtight. We've talked about the what of it. We've talked about the when it is and the why it is and the where it is. And so what that does is that paves the road for us. That paves the road for us to understand the beauty of God's forgiveness and all that the word talks about. And I only used a few scripture in these last few weeks about God's forgiveness. But if we really understand the precious, precious gift that he has given to us to be forgiven, to get another chance, to be cleansed, to keep our clogged drain unclogged, wherever we are that we can breathe out and he's there to forgive us. Why? For his own sake, to keep us in right relationship to him because of his great love. I can't think of a more wonderful way to start spring, since this is, we're just starting in March, as to glory in God's forgiveness. And so let's close the book. God's forgiveness, the case against it, I think is proven that it's there for us if we just call upon him. Let's do that now. Thank you, Jesus, for your great love 
Thank you that I got through 30 minutes <laughs> of talking and my voice held out. Thank you, Lord, for the beauty, beauty, beauty of what you have done for us. Forgiveness. <clears throat> we know that it costs you everything to come and get us. And we thank you for that, Lord. Thank you that you care that we are in right relationship with you after we're saved. Thank you that you care that we were unsaved. Thank you that in the heart of John Harper, you deposited that, that, that there's a chance for life. And, and he was able to answer that call. Thank you, Lord, for um, uh, Aquila Webb, that you saved him eternally that day, Lord. Thank you for forgiveness. We are ever grateful, Lord. And I pray that it might flow through, through us in these next weeks, Lord, as we learn about how our forgiveness can do, can go this way instead of vertical. It can be um, shared horizontally. I pray that you would be the one who speaks, and that your Holy Spirit would lead, lead us into all truth. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. I love you each for um, sticking with uh, the Ladies Bible Study and for sharing it. Uh, some of you share it every week, and that's that's wonderful because it's uh, it's about God's work going forth. I pray you have a wonderful and blessed week, and I'll see you next week.